Ready, Lisa. Philippians tells us I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our first Sunday of Lent worship, and it's good to be with you. It's good to be with you joining us at home as well. Um, we hope that you can feel God's presence as we walk together through these 40 days of Lent. Rhonda has some announcements for us. Justin Feinheider and Anna Losh um, today, and Sue Morrison on the 28th, and David Pettit on March 4th. Bridge Builders will meet Wednesday at 2.40, and Chime Choir is canceled this week and the following. Memorial service for Helen Miller at Wood Court Wright Borkowski Funeral Home on Saturday, March 4th from at 12.30 p.m. And the funeral for John Eskridge will be Friday, March 3rd at 6 p.m. with calling hours from 46 at Wood Courtright 
Borowski Funeral Home. I do study using the walk by Adam Hamilton will begin on Thursday, March 16th at 11.30 a.m. You can order the book through Amazon or Cokesbury. See Pastor Susan if you need her to order the book for you. All are welcome. We will be using Zoom as well if you want to join us from home. Just let Pastor Susan know so she can send you the Zoom info. Um, church will begin starting at 10.30 on um, March 19th. That, that's the first Sunday after the time change. Keeping the tradition of contributing Easter baskets to the Center of Hope, we are seeking donations to help with this outreach project. If possible, items should be gender neutral and appropriate for children 10 years or younger. A list of suggestions is available in the narthex. Of course, monetary donations are also welcome. Items can be placed in the box located in the basement and need to be, be here by Sunday, March 19th. Your help with this worthwhile project is greatly appreciated. And if we can keep the Eskridge family, the Cardinal family, and Danny Sands in our prayers, and my sister-in-law, Cindy Heckert, also she's having um, foot surgery. Do we have anyone else? Can I, 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 oh, I'd like to add, uh, Stephanie got me over to that list. Uh, Jeff continues to go through uh, the clinical tests at the clinic, and, uh, we have several trips to the clinic each week, so uh, let's remember them as well. How is he doing with the treatments, do you know? Well, they seem to be going as they expected right now, anyway. And he's in good spirits. He's uh, um, full of heart and misses seeing people, I'm sure. Do you have an update on Raymond? Uh, yes. Um, well, first off, we really appreciate all the prayers that came his way. They worked. Um, he's been home, been home now a week and a half and still recovering, but doing much better, sleeping better. Um, got a ways to go, but he's doing much, much better. Thank you. That's great. Do we have anyone else? Let's continue with the morning worship. So I was reading about two friends that arranged to meet for coffee um, one Saturday morning before they both headed out to run some errands. And they were talking about what had been going on in their lives and so forth. And the one said, oh, I almost forgot to tell you what happened to me. He said it was last Sunday and I was um, just leaving church and walking out in the church's front yard and I found this wallet and it was packed with money. And the friend said, well, did you give it back? Did you turn it into the church office? And the friend said, well, not yet. I said, I'm still trying to decide if it's a temptation from the devil or if it's an answer to a prayer. <laughs> so sometimes we're tempted. Even Jesus was tempted, and we're going to talk about that today. So let's begin with our call to worship. <clears throat> On these days of Lenten journey, Christ goes with us side by side. While we gather here for worship, may our lives be focused with praise and care. As we sing and pray and listen, may God's spirit deep within us come alive. And may this time of worship be for us a constant guide. Now let, let us sing with joy and vigor as we learn together how to serve Christ more fully. And let's sing together. Um, from the New Century Hymnal number 52, there's a name I love to hear.
Let's join together in our opening prayer and Lord's Prayer. God of love, we invite you to breathe upon us in these moments so that our parched and barren souls may be revived with your quickening spirit. Bring to us now as we wait upon you, your energy, your life, and your strength so that we might do your will as together we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Total response of reading is Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed, Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely, when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart.
The Gospel lesson is Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus said, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Love and peace and mercy be unto you from a loving and a merciful God. <clears throat> well, there was a woman who was on vacation. Um, she lived in New York, but she was vacationing in the South, visiting some of her relatives at Christmas time. And um, she was passing through a small town and she stopped at the intersection. And she just happened to glance over and notice that um, while she was there in the town square, that there was this really nice nativity scene that was set up in front of the gazebo. And as she was admiring it, she noticed that the wise men were wearing firemen's hats and jackets. And she thought, well, now that's kind of strange. And so she continued on through town and she ended up stopping at this little convenience store that was on the edge of town. And she wanted to get something to drink and as she pulled in the into the parking lot, she thought, well, maybe, you know, somebody here can tell me the story behind the nativity scene. Well, the clerk waited on her and, and she seemed very friendly. And so she broached the subject of the wise men's attire with her saying, um, it's a really nice nativity scene that's set up on the town square. And the clerk replied, what, well, you know, why, well, thank you. And she said, I, I was really wondering, though, I couldn't help but notice that the wise men were dressed like firemen. Well, that's right, the clerk replied. Well, why is that exactly? I, I was just curious. And the clerk said, oh, you Yankee Northerners, y'all don't know nothing about the Bible. If you look in the Gospel of Matthew, it says right there that the wise men came from a bar. Oh. <laughs> Well, we all get things confused sometimes or mixed up or messed up, even when we have the best of intentions and maybe even when we don't, which leads us to the devil today in Matthew 4. Now, I don't know if the tempter's intentions in his own mind were right or wrong, but we do know that we definitely know that he took the scriptures and he tried to use them for his own purposes you know twisting the meanings around and trying like everything to make things work out the way that he wanted them to definitely not the way that god wanted them to now looking at the temptations from the world standards they weren't so bad you know were they i mean at the beginning of the reading we're told that jesus fasted for 40 days and he was hungry which is probably a, a bit of an understatement if you think about it. 
But, you know, I think Matthew mentions it because Matthew definitely wants us to know that Jesus is human, and so he hungered and so forth, just like we do, and could also be tempted. So that wily tempter, just trying to be a nice guy, right? You know, says, hey, Jesus, you got to be hungry, man. You know, just turn this, these stones into bread. Pretty tempting, I would think. Makes sense when you're really hungry. But Jesus, I think, reads the real meaning here that the devil is after. But let's wait just a minute about that. Okay, so next, the devil then tries to help Jesus achieve that kind of recognition that he deserves. I mean, after all, we all deserve to be recognized, and we all deserve to have the kind of power that the world tells us that we need to hunger for. Oh, there's that word again, right? Hunger. First, he, he was hungering for nourishment for the stomach, and now there's a hungering for recognition and power none of which are bad desires in and of themselves to be fulfilled, right? But Jesus turns this down too, reading the real reason behind what the devil is trying to offer here. But let's wait a minute for that too. Then the tempter, thinking Jesus has got to be tired, he, he's got to be like a soul weary, looking for some kind of a sign here that Jesus really does care, you know, hungering, for God who will look after his every need. And the devil says, go ahead. You know, takes him up to a high tower, says, throw yourself down here. You know, God will take care of you. God's going to send angels to guard you. It's going to fill you that hunger for love that you have with a little TLC. I'm sure it was tempting. I mean, I think we've all been at a place before where we feel soul weary and we are hungry for some kind of a sign that we are loved for and that we are cared by God. And Jesus, being human, hungered for that just like we do. But he also sees what the tempter is really tempting him with here. And Jesus says, no. He says, you know what? I know God loves me. I don't need to, to prove that. I don't need him to prove it to me with some kind of outlandish acts of rescue and bravery. Jesus knows why the devil is really tempting him here with all of these suggestions. It wasn't that he really cared that Jesus was hungry. It wasn't because he wanted Jesus to experience any kind of true power. It wasn't because he knew Jesus was tired and that he needed to be cared for. No. So why was it that Satan was there if it wasn't for all of these good reasons? Well, it's because he wanted Jesus to fail. He wanted Jesus to follow him. He wanted Jesus to renounce God, to lose sight of who he belonged to. That's why. Now, I was thinking about it this week, and I thought, you know, it's a lot like the drug dealer that, you know, who's standing there pretending to be the kid's very best friend, or... It's a lot like, you know, the pimp in the big city who's there by the bus, the bus stop just waiting for, you know, the girl or the boy from small town Ohio to get off the bus in that big city and pretend like, you know, they've got their best interest at heart. Or it's like the so-called friend who is like your best friend as long as you're buying the drinks for them at the bar. Or maybe it's like that boss that sings your praises as long as you're putting in those 16-hour days for them. But that's why the, that, that tempter was there, you know, when Jesus was, was vulnerable and Jesus was, was lonely and, and Jesus was hungry. It's not because he cared about Jesus. It's because he cared about himself, you know. But Jesus recognized him for who he was, selfish, self-seeking, hateful. But if Jesus was hungry, and if Jesus was vulnerable, and if Jesus was feeling lonely, then what helped him to not give in to those tempting offers of Satan? How did he do it? I think when we read the scriptures and we know Jesus as we do, we know that everything that Jesus did, he said he could do because of God with him that he relied on God being with him, that he relied 
on God's strength in him. He knew who he belonged to. He knew who he was. He knew who really loved him and who cared for him, who had plans for him, and would help him through that. And who was that? Well, it was God. That's who, not Satan, you know, not the world's power, not a crust of bread, but God. Jesus was able to say no to the devil because he had already said yes to God. You know, there's an old saying that says, if you don't know what you stand for, then you'll fall for anything. Well, that's what Jesus knew to be true. And he knew that it was God who stood with him. And it was God who calls us to know ourselves and to know who we stand with as well. We are God's children. You know, I am God's child. Go ahead, say it with me. Say, I am God's child. Say it together. I am God's child. Now say it with conviction. I am God's child. Now say it like it's all capital letters. I am God's child. You know, it makes a difference when we know who we belong to and who we belong with and who is there with us. We belong to God, which means we know that our actions make a difference and how we live our lives makes a difference. It, it gives us the courage to stand up for our beliefs and to stand against what we see as being hateful or self-seeking or any kind of degrading behavior towards others. It's why we can take a stand for what is loving and caring and forgiving because that's how God treats us and stands up for us. We are God's children. We are God's hands. We are God's heart in the world. And what we say yes to and what we say no to really does make a difference because we belong to God. And it's God who gives us the strength and the wisdom and the courage to face those temptations that would make us less than who God created us to be. James C. Brown, who, who's a physician, he writes a story about knowing who we belong to and who strengthens us to face life. He writes this, he says, as a physician involved in the care of children, I'm very fortunate to witness daily the wondrous power and the strength and the faith of the most physically fragile among us. Well, one such event involves Bobby, who's a five-year-old child who had been diagnosed with leukemia at the age of four. Now, Bobby's cancer was in remission, and he was free of the disease, and he had come to the hospital for a series of diagnostic tests that were a routine part of his follow-up treatment program. Now, Bobby had bright blue eyes. He had this kind of shy smile, and at first glance, it didn't reveal the wisdom that was gained through this one-year struggle with cancer. Bobby had lost all of his hair, secondary to the chemotherapy treatment. The chemo had left him nauseous and unable to eat, and he had experienced numerous painful procedures and treatments throughout the, that time, and, and that day was gonna be no exception. The doctor goes on to say, Bobby was undergoing a procedure that was indeed painful. He'd been through it before, so he knew what to expect. He said, I explained to him what we were going to do and why, and the, the importance of him remaining very still. And Bobby assured me that he would be still, and he promised that the nurses and the technologists in um, attendance wouldn't have to hold him down. Now remember, this is a five-year-old. And as we began, he said, Bobby asked, Dr. Brown, would it be okay if I say the 23rd Psalm while you stiff me? The doctor said, well, you know, of course, that would be fine. So Bobby recited beautifully, no tears, no movement. The procedure went very well. And Bobby, in his young wisdom, reassured Dr. Brown. He said, Dr. Brown, it didn't really hurt me, which we all knew that it really had. And then he said, Bobby caught me by surprise when he asked Dr. Brown, do you know the 23rd Psalm? <laughs> And the doctor assured him, well, well, sure. And so then he said kind of doubtfully, well, can you recite it with me? And the doctor said, well, I, I don't know, I think so. And um, <laughs> Dr. Brown said he realized he was going out on a limb here. And Bobby said, okay, let's hear you. 
So Dr. Brown said, I proceeded to stumble through it. My performance was kind of shabby comparison to, to Bobby's. And I didn't even have a needle in my back. So I noticed all the other white coat professionals in the room were trying to kind of disappear <laughs> out of fear that next they were going to be asked to do that. And he said it was more frightening to them than having to go through grand rounds. <laughs> then beautiful Bob, Bobby said to all of us, you know, you really should all learn the 23rd Psalm by heart because when you say it out loud, God hears you and lets you know in your heart that he is being strong for you when you can't be strong for yourself. Well, Dr. Brown ends his story with the words, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Well, we are such as these. We belong to God. It's God who gives us the strength to make those wise decisions and to face those temptations that would lead us to be less than who God created us to be. What we say yes to and what we say no to really does make a difference. Because God calls us to say yes to love and to caring and to nurturing and to that other-centeredness, to joy, to peace, to sympathy and empathy and forgiveness. You know, we are God's children, and by God's strength, we are encouraged to choose that path of abundant life and love. You know, knowing that God is with us through the difficulties and also celebrating with the joys, that's what make it, makes a difference in our lives. Knowing whose we are makes a difference because you are God's child, and that is the good news of the day. Amen. And let's sing together our prayer intro. Loving God, please be with us as we live our lives with all of its challenges. Thank you for listening to us always and helping us to find in you our strength and our wisdom. We affirm with you that it's written, one does not live by bread alone. We ask that you would strengthen and sustain us as we go about our daily lives and as we feel your presence with us that you sustain us through our families and communities, that you nurture bonds between us, and that you inspire us to live with empathy and forgiveness. Help those struggling with work or facing uncertainty in their futures, that they may find peace in your love. We proclaim that it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So help us to admit the temptations of the world and support us to resist turning away from your teaching. Help us to recognize the gifts that you've given each of us and to see the role that we can play in helping to heal your creation. Be with our leaders and those around the world that they may act with compassion and generosity. Guide them to humbly serve their own countries and to foster peace across our borders. God, our creator, please inspire us with hope. We acknowledge that it's written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So we pray that you would deepen our faith to hear your word and to follow your way. Encourage us to bring all our hopes and our desires to you in prayer, that in lifting up our souls to you, we may be shaped by your love. Help us to hear your voice and the answers that we seek. 
Please comfort those battling ill health to bear their pain with patience and strength and courage. And please wrap your love and peace around those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. And we lift up in prayer all those mentioned today out loud and those that we know within our hearts are in need of prayer as well. Holy Spirit, our comforter, please sustain us in times of trial as we place our lives in your hands. Please walk with us in this week. Help us to be your heart and hands in this world. Help us to love with your love and help us to see your face in those that we meet. All of this we pray, assured by your eternal love for us. Thank you for calling us your children. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, let's pause and count those many blessings as we return to God a portion of what he has granted to us. Spirit, you have showered us with your gifts, and we embrace you with thanksgiving. May our embrace be arms wide open, ready to share, to serve, and to love. Please bless the giver and the gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Our closing song is For the Beauty of the Earth.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may his face shine upon you. And I pray that the Lord will be gracious to you and give you peace. In pleasant times, may you always know that every good thing comes from him. In troubled times, may you always know that he is right there by your side. Now go outside, let your light shine, and let these words echo through the seasons of your life. Amen. Thank you. 